Fisher-Price recognises that every child is born with unique gifts and a distinct personality. Our role as parents is to embrace and celebrate who they truly are. This podcast was brought to you by Fisher-Price. Hello and welcome to another episode of Happy Mum, Happy Baby, the podcast. Uh, Last year I wrote a book called Happy Mum, Happy Baby and once that was published I just wanted the conversation to continue. Um, So last series I invited a lot of friends along to talk about their experiences of being a mum and dad, Tom was involved, Uh, and this series is back and we're doing the same thing. Um, In the book I talk about miscarriage, it's kind of where I start the book to be honest because I I felt like it was a massive part of my journey and, uh, and I felt... At first, actually, when I started writing, I wanted to write it down and have it there uh, and know that I could edit it out afterwards because it's something I hadn't really talked about before that. Um, As a result, I started getting involved with uh, a charity called Tommy's. And actually, I'm going to be uh, hosting the Tommy's Awards again this week. So I thought this week the episode should be based around baby loss. And it's a subject that none of us really want to talk about. None of us want you know to even have it enter our heads really it's something that we don't want to um even be faced with but it's a part of life and 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 it happens and and so I've invited two ladies who unfortunately know this area of life um uh, far more than I do and uh, and are equipped to talk about their experiences and stuff um they blog about it in the most beautiful way um, so I wanted to talk to Elle Wright <laughs> and Michelle Cottle about about Teddy and Orla, um, their babies uh, and their experiences. So welcome, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks and for having us. Not at all. It's a bit of a shift, this one, on the podcast. And, and I know, like me saying it's a difficult subject, you ladies are so used to it being called that. And, and I imagine that before, you know, your experiences with Teddy and Orla, you must have that the subject when the subject arised of miscarriage or stillbirth or anything like that how did you handle those conversations before I mean I don't know if I did have those before I mean I'd had an early loss before all or I'd had an ectopic pregnancy so I kind of knew about early losses didn't really talk about them though because I didn't Mm. I didn't really talk to anyone after that happened um but I think for me I suppose the issue is that we don't talk about those things so when Orla died I just felt like I was completely on my own. I, I honestly didn't know that babies could die at full term in a healthy pregnancy. I, I just didn't have those conversations. I think I'm exactly the same. I would yeah. say, yeah, a couple of my friends had had miscarriages and spoken about them very briefly. They were early miscarriages mm-hmm. and I guess maybe they'd kind of dealt with them very well and been of the sort of school of, oh, you know, it wasn't meant to be and and brushed it off and you know maybe they were hugely upset but didn't want to appear so so I kind of went with how they were feeling and and was guided by them on it but I was exactly the same as soon as I was pregnant with Teddy and as soon as you know I was obviously pregnant Mm. I just assumed that 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 was it you know as we all do you're pregnant and you're going to bring your baby home with you so for me and and Michelle I don't think we realized it was a a thing until it was too late and it happened to us and we were in it Mm. Mm. and 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 should we talk about well let's talk about your pregnancies and and your births and and um, and what happened after that really um so I don't know Elle do you want to kick off yeah so I uh found out I was it's actually quite funny because Michelle and I were pregnant at the same time obviously we didn't know each other um so I found out I was pregnant with Teddy, um, pregnant, didn't know I was having a little boy um, until he was born. Mm-hmm. But I found out I was pregnant in September 2015, had a healthy pregnancy. I was working full time, I was working in London, I was working in sales, I was in and out of, of meetings and off, up and down off the tube and all perfectly normal and fine. Um, decided because my job was like that that I would take a little bit more time before baby arrives just Mm -hmm. to kind of stop mainly because my car was so low I couldn't get in and out (laughs) of it at that point Uh, I was kind of rolling out onto the pavement um and so I thought you know it's probably time to slow down and stop so I had about six weeks off I think before Teddy was born which was really good because I just went into nesting overdrive and did all of those things cleaned all the unnecessary things um and uh, I I was actually induced um, at 39 plus three days, right. so it was full term. Um, but I woke up one Sunday morning and um, my waters were leaking 
Of course, I didn't know. I thought I'd completely lost control of my faculties <laughs> once and for all. I mean, it hadn't been that far off. The baby had been trampolining on, on my bladder. So I thought, well, this is it. So I called my mum, as we all do in that in that situation. And she said, well, maybe you should go to the hospital. Went to the hospital, was monitored, you know, for the rest of that day. And I'd said that um, baby's mu- movements had slowed down quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And th- but then miraculously we were in hospital and he starts you know trying to break out, mm-hmm. um and we were told to come back that evening because my waters were leaking and they said yeah risk of infection is too high yeah. baby needs to come out into the world, um so they started the induction process on the Sunday night so that was the fifteenth of May and he was born the following day mm-hmm. after natural labour, um lots of huffing and puffing and gas in there and and um I've seen the photos you look glorious <laughs> you do you do you look so there elegant there is <laughs> one photo that will never ever be seen um on instagram or it's a photo that my husband took in the sort of the last moments when i'm leaning over a bed and it's just the look of my face and i and i'm not looking i just look like a desperate woman um and i did i felt desperate in that moment i think as we all do um and then there's that moment of release and relief isn't there where you're like thank god yeah um, and Teddy was born, uh, found out he was a boy, and uh, something wasn't quite right straight away. He was um, he was really quiet, and mm. his eyes were closed. And I, I don't know, I guess I'd watch too much One Born Every Minute. And to yeah. me, a baby's supposed to come out and, ah, you know, <laughs> all hell breaks loose. Mm. Um, and I sort of remember sensing the quiet in the room, like the deafening quiet. And one of the midwives said, oh... Dad, do you want to cut the cord? Um, we're just going to take we're just going to take baby away, and and with that, hastily, my husband cut Teddy's cord, and they sort of disappeared out the room with him. And, out the room. Yeah. So I'm thinking, what the hell? What the hell is going on? Um, and after about twenty minutes or so, which obviously felt like a lifetime, yeah. and I'd you know delivered placenta and was back up on the bed being sorted out down there yeah. shall we say <laughs> and um this smiling consultant comes back in bundle bundle of baby and towels and everything's fine and you know he just needed a rub down with a towel and a bit of oxygen and he's fine and my husband's saying to me he's fine he's fine it's all okay um and you know we told our families and everything it, happy memories loads of happy memories as I'm sure you have Mm -hmm. from your two boys um facetimed my mum with baby and and um then because it was the evening they said you know we need to get you back down to a ward but because he was born with a few difficulties we're we're going to put you on a ward where he'll be monitored a little bit more through the night which for me was okay yeah fine of course that that makes sense um so that was sort of late evening and um she woke me up initially, the midwife, I guess I'd been sort of snoozing. Nico was with me, my husband was with me. About an hour after um, we tried to go to sleep, I was exhausted because I'd been awake for like two days at this point. And she just said, Teddy's, or baby, we hadn't named him by that point, um, baby's really cold, um, can you just give him a cuddle? And I thought, yeah, that's fine, babies can't regulate their own body temperature yet. Gave him a cuddle and then she came back and checked and said, yeah, you can put him put him back in and and then the next time that she woke me up uh, that midwife was about an hour later and she was shaking my shoulder to the point where she was she was lifting me off the bed to wake me up and all I ever remember her saying is he's really cold I've got to take him and it doesn't matter how many times I tell this story it just gets me every time because I think and I'm sure Michelle will agree. When, when you think about it again, you play it back in your head. Yeah. It's like with anything, you know, traumatic. You play it back in your head. And I guess the out the, the standout memory for me was as she lifted Teddy up, um, his arms flopped down by his side. And I think I knew in that second something was really wrong. Um, and she ran away with him and curtains were pulled around us and a midwife came in and was sort of rubbing my arm and it's okay, he's with the doctors, it's it's okay, he's going to be okay, it's, mm. you know, not to worry, he's in the best place. Um, about half an hour passed and we were taken to another room um, when a consultant came in to talk to us and he sort of crouched down in front of us to talk to us and I thought, oh, um, you know, this is this is not good news and 
in my head, you know, the worst had already happened. But then he said, your little boy's really poorly. So I was thinking, he's not dead. He's not dead. That's all I remember thinking. Um, But they said, well, you know, we can't look after him here because he had been revived for 18 minutes by the time they got him back. Um, And obviously with a tiny little body like that. um, And he said, I don't know how long he wasn't breathing before we got to him. And I don't know what damage has been done. Um, So the following morning he was transferred from the Skaboo units, which was at that hospital, Royal Surrey, where he was born, which is a special care baby unit. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that until Teddy was born, because why would I? Yeah. And he was taken to Ashford and St Peter's Hospital in St Chertsey, in Chertsey, which um, has a NICU unit, which is a neonatal intensive care. Mm-hmm. Um, again, I didn't know what any of they were just acronyms. They were just sounds to me. I I, I knew nothing in that moment. Um, he was there for three days before the consultants who were caring for him all agreed, as did other consultants at Great Ormond Street and, and other places they consulted with, that there wasn't anything that they could do for him. Mm. And he would say he was there for three days until they withdrew his life support. But they did that away from the unit, um, in a room with my, me and my husband, and we you know we were flanked by our parents and my sister-in-law and her husband, and every single doctor and nurse who'd had anything to do with his care was there. And they let us do it in a really nice way. Mm. They let us, you know, hold him, and we read him a story, um, because I'd be leaning over his crib, reading him stories, probably annoying the hell out of him, (laughs) but the whole time he was there, trying to will him to wake up. Um, And and we read him, uh, Guess How Much I Love You?, Um, which is not a book I've ever read since, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, uh, and he he just, yeah, they took all his what He didn't have in his wires or anything like that, or any of the things that he'd had on him these past few days. And he just looked like a little normal baby, like a beautiful baby. Um, and he just looked like he went to sleep. It's so lovely that you had that, that those special moments with him, you know. Yeah, and I do, I do feel so, so fortunate. And I know, I always say this to Michelle because our experiences are, are so different. Mm-hmm. And you know, I, I have those really fiercely happy moments. Those, oh my God, I'm bursting with pride. This is the the best moment of my life like you do when your firstborn child arrives and then I have the uh, the other end of this of the scale so I never really share the pictures of Teddy when he was in the NICU unit I only have a a few Mm -hmm. um all the ones I share are the ones from the day that he was born when everything was fine oh yeah that it's so difficult isn't it um and actually you you found Michelle a few weeks later, I, you know, little, did, you, did you know that Michelle was going through, you know, your your yeah. your, your um, situation just a few weeks before, and you yeah. started blogging about it pretty much not that long after. Not that long after. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of weird because uh, it's so weird listening to you sort of tell the early story of your pregnancy because actually we were almost living kind of parallel lives and didn't know each other. I mean, mm. we fell pregnant. At, I mean, literally the same time. Yeah. I found out I was pregnant in September as well, and um, and both of our babies were born in May. So yeah, our, and both working London, and um, yeah, our stories were very similar up until, I guess, the point that, um, well, my story is slightly different with Orla because she mm. was she was stillborn, so she died before she was born. Mm. Um, I mean, I think yeah, I was thirty seven weeks pregnant, so just a little bit. Had you suspected anything? No, I mean, I'd had, like, I look back at it with such, uh, we talk about happy memories. I actually look back at my time being pregnant with all that, and I'm, that, those few months, I, I can honestly say I was just blissfully happy. I'm probably one of those annoying people that 
really enjoys being pregnant. <laughs> um, don't, I mean, I do get the bloat and you know all of that stuff, but I, I really, really was just so happy and everything was fine. And in fact, at the hospital I'm at um, in South London, they actually give you uh, scans at 36 weeks as standard. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd had that scan on the Tuesday and everything was fine. Um, everything was fine. And they're very thorough at my hospital. Like they're right. a research hospital. So everything was absolutely fine. That was the Tuesday. Um, and then by the weekend, oh, like you know, I was still at work. You know, I, weekend came. I was kind of feeling a bit weird. Like I didn't there wasn't anything in particular I just didn't feel right Mm. and I think that's something I'd always say to someone just trust your gut instinct if you don't feel right it doesn't matter if there's no specific symptom if you don't feel right just go and speak to someone but I don't know I just kind of thought well I'm coming to the end of pregnancy I'm big I'm heavy and you know maybe this is just what happens you're slowing down and and actually now I understand a lot more about movements but probably on reflection I think Orla was probably moving less Mm -hmm. that weekend um, but it got to Sunday and that was the day that I turned 37 weeks. So I was full term and it's this, you know, milestone to get to. And, um, and I was like, do you know what, actually, I, d- I don't feel right. I really, I need to go and speak to someone about this. And obviously it's Sunday night. Um, so I ended up just going into hospital to the labour ward and just saying, I, I don't know, I, something doesn't feel like it's right. And did they listen? They did, yeah. They were very good. Like I'd I'd phoned my midwife beforehand, and she was like, "Yep, go up, go up to hospital. They'll just they'll put you on the monitor. They'll you'll be on there for half an hour, and then you'll be back home." And it was, I was like, "Yeah, yeah, that, that's what's going to happen. I'm just going to go up there. I'll be monitored, and I'll come back home." Um, it's funny because that day was the day that I'd allowed myself to wash all of all as clothes or we didn't know we were having a girl like that um so they were all, I remember doing all the washing that day and laying out all of her clothes on the clothes horse to dry and then we went off to hospital and um and they, they you know they sort of took us in and I just remember sort of being taken into the the triage room laying down on the bed and the midwife coming in and trying to listen in with the I think probably I think the first time with the handheld Doppler and she was sort of moving around and couldn't pick something up and I could feel I could feel my anxiety building and kind of going okay she's struggling to find something here that something's not right and then she wheeled in the other machine the um the CTG machine and was starting to listen around with that and and I could hear I could hear what she could hear because you know it's quite loud isn't it? those yeah. machines are kind of woof, woof, woof. and I could hear that I th- that she was picking up my heartbeat, but that sounds very different from a baby's because a baby's is, is a lot quicker. And um, and I could tell that she was struggling again, so she went off and she brought in the doctor and the doctor wheeled in um, one of the portable ultrasound machines and started scanning. And I was laying on the bed and the doctor was, was by my feet and she had the machine and um, Andy was sat the other side, actually. He, he couldn't see the machine couldn't see the, the the monitor and I remember her going round with the the wand and looking round and I just remember looking over at that screen um and knowing that what I was seeing is not what I should have been seeing mm-hmm. because it was it was just still like I could see I could see my baby in there and I could see that my baby wasn't moving and I could see that where there should be a thumping heart, there was nothing but stillness. Um, and I remember in that moment thinking, I can't look at this anymore. So I turned and looked at the wall and just kind of thought, oh my God, I think I think my life is just about to collapse around my ears. And the doctor turned off the screen and put her hand on my leg and said, I'm really sorry. And I, in that moment, I just knew. And she didn't... Uh, I'm pretty sure she didn't have to say there's no heartbeat because she knew that I knew and I knew what she had seen. Um, and I, but I know that Andy hadn't. And I know, I think I can't, I can't remember exactly whether it was me or the doctor or someone had to say, this is what's happened to I mean, your baby has died. And then it all, I don't know, it all sort of happened very quickly then. The, suddenly the room was full of people. There was doctors and midwives and, um, and I'm just laying there thinking, oh my goodness, like, this this cannot be happening sorry um and suddenly they're just all talking about 
delivery and birth and um you know you 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 going to have to be induced you going to have to have this baby now and that's something that people i think really don't know i mean i've had a couple of friends no. who have gone through it and i had no idea that actually if if something like that happens during pregnancy that you still have to give birth like i had no idea that that was the case no and i think at that moment you just think i how how on earth do you expect me to do that like yeah. is this some kind of sick joke like seriously is this a sick joke that you're going to expect me to to actually have to give birth now um and that i mean i can i can look at it from two sides now i can see the person that i was then sat there going no 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 you can't make me do this please just put me to sleep put me to sleep and just you know give me a c-section you know, take take my baby out i can't do this i don't have the strength to do this and you know they're sort of saying things like well it's best for you and if you want to have more babies and i'm like in this moment I can't think about that I want this baby I want you to somehow make this baby alive like how how can you expect me to go through this do you think emotionally and mentally it's it's also advised to do it that way because there's a feeling of you bringing that baby into the world and I think I don't know it's a tough one isn't it because I definitely I know of people who have had to have C-sections in, in mm. those circumstances because actually their baby is in a position that they can't give yeah. birth to them. So, And I wouldn't say that their experience is less um, cathartic, val- you know, yeah, yeah. valid, important. I think I think it is based on, I think it needs to be based on what's right yeah. for mum and baby in that, um, in that situation. For me, looking back, I, I can't tell you how proud I am that I gave birth to Orla and I think I think probably I would have felt like that however I gave mm-hmm. birth to her but I'm so proud because that was one of the hardest most torturous emotionally mentally experiences that I had to go through um yeah it was yeah it's, it's hard work giving birth to a baby that's already gone um you have to do all the work the baby can't help you yeah. but you just don't know like I mean, I didn't know what my baby was going to look like. Like, would she look like a, a normal baby? Like, would what would happen? And actually, you know, she did. And, you know, she was a beautiful baby. She she was fully formed and there's nothing wrong with her. And, and, and I guess that's the, the really difficult thing is knowing that there was nothing wrong with her or with me. Um, but no, I think now I'm able to kind of go, I'm really glad that I gave birth to her and it's probably the best thing I ever did. Um, and I'll always, always be proud of that. But I think, I don't know. I, it's a, There's a big debate, isn't there, at the moment about sort of elective C-sections and, you know, giving birth, I say naturally, in inverted commas, because, yeah. you know, all birth is natural, however mm-hmm. you do it. Um, and I wonder whether the shift in that with people going through live baby labours will kind of transpose onto babies that have already passed and whether people will have more choice I don't know because I think in that moment I probably would have said put me to sleep yeah I mean put me to sleep and don't ever wake me up that's what that's the reality I I didn't want to I didn't want to continue living how could I and my baby had just died and everything had crumbled around me um in the that time following both Teddy and all his births how did you go about sort of what 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 do you do like what what happened in those first few hours and those days because obviously you've got people who want to hear from you are expecting that news like how do you actually go about handling that do you do you just shut the door and don't even think about it um you know (sighs) it's so it's so difficult and I think it's just when what should be the happiest news turns into the saddest. It's like everything we're expecting flips upside down and becomes the polar opposite to what it should be. And that's, you know, birth turning into death It is exactly that, isn't yeah. it? And I think our human reaction to that is, like Michelle said, I, I, I cannot carry on. This is This is not happening. This is absolutely the universe playing some sort of horrible trick on me and it's all going to be fine and I'm going to wake up and it's going to be over 
And I remember this the car journey that we had home from the hospital where luckily my brother-in-law had gone down to the car and sort of hidden the car seat, you know, that we'd put in the car expecting to bring a baby home and he'd done all of that so that we could just get back into our car and drive home and my husband drove us home and it was like a 40 minute drive and I just remember sitting there in silence thinking shit this is my new reality what the hell has just happened and you know we went home that evening my parents came back with us and my mum said you should go to bed you need to rest oh, I said, I can't sleep. I can't, what, what? We've just come home from hospital and my son's died and well, let's all go to bed. And I just, I didn't even know where to start. I, mm. I just saw this expanse of nothingness out in front of me. And the thought of talking to anyone or telling my friends what had happened. Um, because Teddy had been in hospital for a few days, obviously we dropped off the radar so a lot of my friends already knew he'd been born and knew he was in hospital and knew he was very poorly so the night that he died um I text my best friend one of my best friends Zoe and I just said this is what's happened I'm gonna need you to tell everyone I'm gonna need you to 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 tell everyone because I can't say it and you know it's times like that I think you really value I mean, I just became so appreciative of how awesome my friends were. And she, I don't think there was anyone she didn't let know, you know, she covered all bases and she made sure she even went into like my old workplace who I was still, because she was close by to those guys. And I used to work in a hotel in a spa and she went into the hotel that was down the road from her house to tell the guys who owned the hotel, who'd come to my wedding, who, you know, really good friends with to tell them because she didn't want anybody you know to to come across me and and ask if the baby had been born she I think she played out every scenario in her head and and we just shut ourselves off from the world for I don't know a few weeks it feels like weeks and I I couldn't leave the house I couldn't I was utterly broken I couldn't sit up in bed in the morning I was everything I had to you know swing my legs around to the side of the bed and actually get up and do life and I know Michelle and I have had that conversation before mm. couldn't sleep couldn't you know all those normal functions <laughs> that you wanted living I couldn't do it I guess as well because of those nine months you're kind of gearing towards that moment yeah. and then suddenly that moment is so far removed from what you thought it was going to be and also the, the world continues around you. I think like I, I did, um, when I was pregnant, I, I did NCT classes. I did hypnobirthing. I did yoga sort of, you know, a couple of times a week. I'd made all these local friends, all these mums that we were all pregnant at the same time. Um, I know that a couple of the NCT babies were born the same weekend that I went into hospital. And that was really hard because I just felt, I felt suffocated by the world continuing around me I'd gone to all this effort to I'd set up a life for myself I guess that I thought I was going to have which was going to be maternity leave coffees walks in the park with my baby in the pram and that continued for everyone else and it didn't for me and I just I remember going out leaving the house and walking always with Andy like I, I really struggled to leave the house by myself for a while actually like I just everything became very scary the world became a very scary place and seeing people in the distance that I knew that I'd met through various different classes and literally crumbling and running back home and hiding at home and not leaving the house I remember one particular instance of almost bumping into someone um, and she was pushing her pram with her husband and I, I honestly thought Oh my God, if I have to speak to her, I think I might, I might just die on the spot. I just, I don't know how I'm going to cope with this. And I just went home and sobbed and sobbed and didn't leave the house again for days. And it's just this kind of, it's just a, such a surreal thing to happen that the world does continue and other people continue to have healthy babies and can be happy and yours just ends and it's something that you just cannot put into words that it's so 
visceral it's so all consuming it oh just becomes goodness. your in, it become that moment just becomes your entire life and yeah i think there there is a point isn't there where you, like you just said you you look out the window and you and i remember sitting in bed and looking out the window and seeing all the light come through the shutters i could hear the builders shouting on the roof opposite i could hear people walking to work and you know teddy had died a few days ago and i remember thinking nobody has a clue nobody in the outside world has a clue what's just happened to mm. us why would they mm. life keeps going the world keeps turning and and it was kind of like this lightning bolt moment where i thought you know you, you can either choose to participate in life or you can curl up in a ball in the corner and th- th- that is your a, a, a mm. choice aren't you that that is your choice yeah. and everybody always says and i know that we both get this you're so brave you're so brave you're so you you're, you've been so brave i don't think i'm brave at all i don't th- you know i love michelle but i don't think she's brave you know i <laughs> Sorry, i think yeah. i think <laughs> no, I, I you know but, but i think she would agree it's yeah, not yeah. it's not me being we're not brave we it's like anything with life you get faced with something that you weren't expecting and you kind of take a moment and you swallow and you go, right, OK, how are we going to deal with this? And I think losing a, your child, losing a baby, although it's like the the h- highest point of utter shit on the scale, it's no different. You There comes a point where you say, OK, how am I going to deal with this? How am I going to move forward from this? Because I cannot stay in my bedroom forever with the shutters mm. closed crying. There has to come a point. You know, and whether that is walking down the street and taking a different path than you used to so that you don't bump into people. Mm. I started shopping at a different supermarket really? because I was too scared th- to, for the women on the tills who'd spoken to me the whole time that I was pregnant. Oh, not long to go now then, you know, chit chat, they all yeah. do it. I didn't want to have that conversation with a complete stranger. You do, you find you find strategies, don't you? Like I... um I mean, obviously, they're both both our babies were born in in May, so it was a, a a really nice sunny time. I actually felt like the weather was mocking me. I wanted it to be Taunting. dark, yeah. and miserable, and cold. Reflect and it wasn't. My mood. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't. It was sunny, <laughs> and the blossom was out, and I just felt like I felt like I had to go out, but I didn't want to. Yeah. It was it, it was really. I find the change in season very difficult, and actually, although I love this change in spring, I, it brings up quite a lot of difficult memories, really. But yeah, I, I would do things like I'd go out without contact lenses in. So the world was quite blurry. I couldn't really see people very far in the in the distance until they were up close and then I could just pretend I didn't see them. I'd wear sunglasses, and which was socially acceptable, I guess, in that. <laughs> that's why I was about the weather. Um, you know, when it's sunny, it's okay to, to kind of wear glasses. And those sorts of things I would do just so that I was taking... It was taking those baby steps of, like, mm. going out and, and dipping your toe in the world again, but still feeling utterly broken and um yeah I think those first things you just you do whatever you can shop in different supermarkets walk go out at night we we would go out actually at night yeah, Andy and I and walk walk, around the streets walk both at night because I didn't want to bump into yeah. anyone who I'd bumped into while I was pregnant we do, and also you just think oh well you know people who've maybe had babies they're going to be they're safe they're going to be at home like yeah. I'm less likely to bump into babies at night your whole world becomes like navigating just trying to protect yourself because you're so fragile that you do anything you can to kind of wrap yourself in some kind of bubble wrap and keep yourself safe avoid certain situations yeah create ones that yeah it's just a a permanent sort of time continuum of of trying to find a new normal i guess and it's everything it's not it's everything it permeates every aspect of your life it's not things that you don't even think about yeah nowhere it feels like nowhere safe oh, it's everywhere isn't it yeah it's on the tv it's adverts it's in magazines that you would have had lying around the house it's, yeah you know in on buses that go but you don't know yeah. where those little things that are gonna yeah and when you're expecting a baby oh, i don't know if you guys both found this but when i was expecting teddy particularly as i sort of came towards the end of the pregnancy and you know i was on maternity leave Everything changed, you know, my hobbies and, and interests changed, my Instagram feed changed. I, I yeah. was 
you know, Definitely. following mother care and all those kind of things. And suddenly, you know, all the people that I w- was following on Instagram, that kind of changed. And I, it was, I was going to be a mum and it was all going to be lovely and it was spring mm-hmm. and I was going to be, again, walking around <laughs> Blossom Field Parks with my new baby. And, and it, you just get this sense that you've been well and truly unceremoniously booted out of the club, brutally. Yeah. And that's what it feels like. You see all these other women with prams and you think, no, why? That, that, I, that me. was me. I was at the door. I put my coat on the rail. I was in. And then, uh, no. And it just... It's so true. I remember... Um, because, it, yeah, it's just it felt like everywhere there were people pushing prams. And I do remember we were driving back from the funeral home one day. Um, we went there to visit all of actually every day that she was there I just felt like I needed to kind of consume every moment I could with her and um getting stuck at the traffic lights next to the park where near where we live and it just being full of mums pushing prams and I just remember turning to Andy and going will I ever be one of those will will that ever be my life because it feels so far away right now um and yeah uh, you just suddenly feel you feel like you're not part of that club and then you also feel that um people who were in that club are scared of you like uh, I think I was terrified of how I'd respond to people if I bumped into them but also how they'd respond to me and I remember having this horrible um situation I went this was weeks later I managed to go to a local cafe to meet my yoga teacher who has become a very very good friend like she she's just awesome absolutely awesome and she was just came around and held my hand um yeah in those kind of early weeks and I was kind of brave enough to go out and meet her for a coffee and someone who was from my yoga class who was weeks behind me in pregnancy turned up and she was she was like I think she was overdue by that point so she's heavily pregnant and I saw her and she saw me and I saw in her face what I feared was that she was she was scared to see me and um, you feel like such an outcast and like um you just feel really ashamed that someone could look at you and you can see the terror in their face that they're like oh my god what what do I do what do I say and she couldn't get away fast enough. And in some ways, I was glad because I was like, "Oh, I feel to talk to you yeah, please, yeah, please get your lovely, lovely, yeah, get your lovely, beautiful bump away." Because I just, I can't. I'm so jealous. I'm so jealous of where you are. I'm so envious, and I feel so broken by the fact that I don't, I don't have my bump anymore, and I don't have a baby. But it also just felt, it just felt horrendous. It was everything that I had feared and. I remember I, I I remember the Instagram post I put up that day or the day after and I was just in bits because I was just like, I miss the old me. Mm. I want to be me again, who was in that club, who was accepted in that club, um and was happy. And I don't want to be the person that I am right now. I don't want to be broken. I don't want to be the one who is scared of the world because the world seems to be pregnant or has a baby. And I found that very, very hard, this kind of, you're in the club and then you're not. It's the way that people look at you that I just... Yeah. This, we always joke about the sympathetic head tilt. Oh, no, I do all the time. It's the same thing with me. I know. Head tilt. But, um, <laughs> but it is... It, it, it becomes like a bit of a running joke when... I, I think, with anything in life, it, sometimes if you didn't laugh, you would just cry continually. And people's reaction becomes exactly that every time they say are you okay are you okay and they tilt their head to the side and you just think just I just don't ask me how I'm feeling because that was one thing that I found is my friends didn't really know what to say you know they'd never experienced it they 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 couldn't help it was no one could help it, it happened and so everyone just kind of looks at you and tilts their heads and says how are you feeling and it's probably the one time in your life when you could you are not equipped to to say out loud how you are feeling because you can't even put you can't make sense of it you can't put it into words 
it's such a pointless question. How are you feeling? And you well, can't, you can't answer. I'm all right. Well, yeah. yeah. Fine. yeah what do you yeah. say? What do I say? Do I lie and do what all British people say and say, "Yeah, fine. How are you?" Because that's what we do, isn't it? And because I'm not fine, do I just say, "My baby's just died. I feel utterly broken and really crap." And actually, so it just there's it's, no good question to ask. I think. But it's it? an interesting thing, though, isn't it? Because I think you we spoke out before, and uh, and you've said to me how. Um, you can say to someone, someone can ask you about your grandparents and you can say, actually, you know, I've just lost my grand, like my gran. And they'll be like, oh, I'm so sorry. And the conversation carries on. Whereas if someone asks you about if you're a mum and you say, actually, yes, uh, but unfortunately, Teddy died, the conversation sort of ends. You see the panic on their faces and they don't know what to do. And uh, and that's why we're having this chat. That's why we do so much work with Tommy's because we want those conversations to, to not end there. Yeah. Mm. But people don't know how to continue. Like, how do you continue that conversation? It's only through working with Tommy's and meeting you, Michelle, and literally hearing in the VT before you won your Tommy's award that actually you love hearing all his name. I love it. See, I absolutely love it. But it's... so many people would naturally kind of think it's such a bad thing that's happened and you don't want to, you don't want to talk about it. We mustn't talk about yeah. it. And I think we're, um, you know, we're, programmed aren't we society has taught us that for decades and decades that it's a it's a no-gay subject and it is so terrifying it is so unthinkable we were Mm. saying on the way over here you know i think that's why our friends didn't know what to say and couldn't quite help um because your mind never quite lets you go to that place that is totally unthinkable and totally dark and you know you can't fathom what that might feel like so it doesn't allow you to step into that place and so you you're as a friend you're very helpless trying to help somebody who that's just happened to and I think that was why for me when I felt like I was losing my mind because nobody understood me and I you know I turned to Instagram for very different reasons for to be able to scroll through in a feed of nice interiors or whatever it was I wanted to look at that day and I think because I'd shared a couple of um of photos of Teddy and linked them to our fundraising I mean say what you want about that Instagram algorithm but on that day it knew what it was doing because in my suggested pops up a photograph and it was a, a wall and it had graffiti and it said London I remember that day. Oh my god, I remember that day. And Michelle had written a post about how she just gone back into re-entered the world and how difficult it was and how she couldn't walk down the street without wearing sunglasses. And she was surrounded by pregnant women and she didn't know what to do. She wanted to run screaming. And I just remember thinking, that's me. That this woman is writing. And my heart was literally in my throat because I thought she lives in London. She's not too far. You know, <laughs> be my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, desperate or what? Um, and I could see people commenting and they, they'd they lost babies too. And I was thinking, what is this world that I've just, you know, scratched the surface of? And I remember thinking, you sod it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something. So I just commented and said, you know, I've just read about all of them. So, I'm going through this journey at the moment too and it sucks and you know I think I just said something like hang in there because I wanted to say something positive to her because I could see her words and see how much she was hurting and within a couple of minutes she replied to me and later that day you sent me a message and said we're going to start a whatsapp group this might not be your thing I know I don't know you but do you want in and I was like yes (laughs) more than you could ever know I want in (laughs) And, you know, that, that for me was the, the the moment, probably the tipping point between going from nobody understands me, nobody's going to get this, I am the only one that this mm. has ever happened to, to, thank God, somebody gets it. And, you know, you, you don't ever want any of your friends to get it. And it, it's just sad that there are other women out there who do get it because they've lived through it. But to have them and to have them to talk to and to you know, moan to quite often or or say the things that you can't say in front of your friends because you feel like you're going mental um, and they won't understand. I can say it to these guys and they're like, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, me too. <laughs> it just goes to show as well the power of power of social media. I mean, it's, 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 you know, rubbish so much. There's so much negativity around it. But actually, if you get in the right community, it's amazing. And for you girls, it's literally brought you 
so close together. I mean, it's a life changer. What made you start sharing in the first place, Michelle? Do you know what? It's a funny one because I've been talking about this recently to someone and I can't remember a specific moment. Actually, those kind of those months feel quite quite sort of hazy. I think what happened was that in those early weeks after Orla died, um, Andy and I were just thinking. Andy's my husband. Um, we were thinking about like what are we, how are we going to survive this, and we we decided together we were going to go away. We're going to go away for a few months. We've travelled before. It's kind of like our thing to our happy place is mm-hmm. to just go go somewhere. Um, obviously I was on maternity leave with no baby he was able to take some time off and we decided to go away um, and Andy wanted to do a bike ride from Canada to Mexico um, sure. just yeah <laughs> just one of those just things a few miles. Just a bike Andy <laughs> <laughs> nothing big <laughs> so I was like oh, okay well um, I'm not going to cycle because I can't really ride a bike so um, yeah I'll, I'll sort of I'll come and drive and you know this will be an adventure together and then we thought oh, okay I wonder whether we could raise some money I wonder whether we could do it as a fundraising thing and and then I was like okay well maybe maybe social media is the way to go to do that maybe I could you know get some help and guidance on how do you use social media for good stuff and somehow that's how it all came about and it all does feel very hazy and I can't really remember I just can't really remember vividly that time because I think I mean I you just started Gosh, typing. Yeah, I mean, I think it was literally just survival. It's like I needed to to put the words out there to say, my baby died. Oh, you know, my baby actually died and I'm still living. It was this weird, I was thinking about this the other day, this weird sort of, you feel like you're most weak and you're most broken and also you're most strong and powerful both at the same time because you think, this awful thing's just happened and I'm still breathing I'm still, still standing, standing. Yeah. like how is this happening and uh, you know it's just sort of I just needed to to talk to people and, yeah. and share and maybe because of my job I just know that the power of language and talking and sharing I know I know that that is is what makes a difference and I and I think both of your posts are incredible I, I read them both and I think I read them and I kind of go yes yeah I, I, I never thought of it like that like the post you uh, posted recently about uh, rainbows uh, about how so many people are saying oh, I hope you get your rainbow baby and but actually that's actually so much pressure it's it's so loaded actually in ways other people don't necessarily know and and you've gone through um you've lost another child since teddy and and it's things like that that people don't necessarily know on on social media and but you put it so eloquently in a in a post that kind of shifts your mind when you think about it um and, and, and there's just so many posts from both of you that that's why i think it's so important that people share that we can't just keep closed behind you know uh, i don't know i just think it's so important to get those words out there and it, and, and i and there's so many things like you know you've had esme and and uh, and you're talking now about postnatal depression but also that guilt and everything that comes of mm. thinking about Orla. and and you know this podcast could have been hours and hours and hours and hours long and uh, and i just feel like get on those blogs even if it's not something that you've experienced before read about what other people go through because mm. it's so important and it's it's a long it, it, the effect is kind of long-standing it's not um it's not something that you just kind of get over or move on from no. and, and it does impact on later things like having other babies and um yeah I I think I I was very lucky I had Esme very quickly but actually what it meant was that my grief was sort of put on hold mm. and it all came out when when she was here and I suddenly was you know at home and I couldn't do all the things that I could do to to manage my grief and it all came spilling out but I think you you don't just lose a baby you lose you lose the whole future I actually I remember although I found babies very difficult when Orla was born when, when she died and after I'd given birth to her I found children very difficult as well because I all I could think was Orla's never going to be three. She's never going to be four. I'm never going to hear what her voice sounds like. I wonder what, you know, what kind of things she would have been into. And that doesn't stop. Like, I'll always wonder that because every baby do. I'm sure your two boys are really different. They're sort of characters. And mm. having Esme doesn't take away from what I still wonder about Orla. I, yeah, I really wonder, would she have had blonde it stays, hair? Or... It stays with you. I was having this conversation with my mum a few weeks ago. So it used to be... When, after Teddy first died, women with prams, pregnant women, when they were near me, I'd get the 
the angsty feeling in my chest and you know it was so close to home and so close to what had just happened now I look at toddlers and I think oh I wonder if I wonder if Teddy would have been about that size I wonder mm. if you know he would have looked like that I wonder if he would have been the kid screaming in the restaurant throwing things around that everyone's so <laughs> of course not he would have been an angel just for the record <laughs> obviously <laughs> uh, you know and that's the other thing about we we I guess we probably have developed quite a dark sense of humor in the fact that you know where when your child does die I mean that there aren't many good good pointers you can pull from it but I mean, you can certainly put them up on a pedestal and pretend that they would have been an absolute, you know. And we do, don't we? We joke, we joke about it. And I think you kind of have to, have to do that. And my husband and I always do it. We go, no, Teddy wouldn't, Teddy wouldn't have done that. Of course he wouldn't. He would have been an angel. Next one's going to be an angel. You know, next one's going to really teach me a lesson, I imagine. But, um, <laughs> but it, it is. It's like you kind of have to. But but now for me it's toddlers. Yeah, I look at I look at toddlers and I think oh, and you know I'm sure 18 years down the line it's going to be people mm. at university that make yeah. me think oh I wonder if Teddy would have gone to university and it, it never stops the mm. the ripples go out so far and wide further and wider than you could you could ever imagine and not just for us either I think for our families mm. and our friends and yeah. you know our parents and our brothers and sisters is it's just. The more you think about it, it's just, yeah, it impacts everybody hugely. What advice, or if you could offer any words to, to the families and the friends of, of people going through it, what would you say to them? It's really difficult. The, the, the questions about what advice you would give, I think, are really difficult because I think everyone is so different yeah. in what they need and, and their grief and... Um, I know what I need now is probably very different than what I needed before. Um, I think, gosh, I don't know. I mean, I, th I think continuing to include the baby mm. forever, you know, sort of acknowledging birthdays and Christmases and talking about them and wondering about them and um, saying, sharing when you think about them, because I don't doubt for a minute that everyone in my family and my friends they think about all of for various di various different reasons and you know like it's all often you know nice little things like oh I was you know shopping and I saw an Orla Keeley yeah. you know mug or whatever and it made me think of Orla and those sorts of things it's you know, just talk talk about her tell me that you're thinking about her because the further we the further we go away from um their birth yeah. the more I feel like sometimes she's becoming like a figment of my imagination. Like, did did she really exist? Did yeah. she really exist? And she exists because we talk about her. Yeah. And that's I think that's what I would say is just talk. And it's just nice to know when people aren't afraid to say their names out loud. And um, it it makes me think, yeah, they're still they're still thinking about yeah. him. They they still see me as. A mum, because when you don't have a baby, phys a, a child physically here, it's quite easy to feel like that title's kind of stripped from you. And you know, the further that that he gets away, I just don't want that to be the case. And I think my family and friends are brilliant, and and they do. My mum always talks about Teddy as if you know, she drops his name in in conversation casually all the time, and that's lovely because. It makes him part of the family yeah. still, rather than, oh, we know that's happened and we're going to leave it in the past and we're going to move on. But like Michelle said, I think everyone's reactions are so different. Um, it's so difficult to give a piece of single advice to a family member or a friend um, in that moment when that those grieving parents have just lost their child because we all react so differently. Yeah. And I get it asked... I don't know if you do, I get asked all the time. Yeah. It's it's not necessarily the bereaved parents themselves who get in touch with me. It is the sisters, yeah. mm. the friends, mm. the... And it happens every week. Every, every week, every few days, I get a message. My friend's in hospital. She's just found out her daughter's going to be stillborn. Help me. What do I say? What do I do? Do I send anything? Do I not send anything? Do I... And you can... You, I can... I can sense the desperation and the turmoil in these messages and, and then they're punched out in a moment of, of utter I have got no idea mm. what to do um, 
and I always come back with you know the same just please don't please don't not say anything please Mm. even if you haven't got the right words which I'm sure you don't feel like you have the right words because none of us do there aren't any right words to say I mean just send a whatsapp with a load of hearts in it I mean send a pigeon I don't care just send something Mm. that shows that person that you are acknowledging that they are have just lost their child and they are having the utterly single most awful moment of their life and that when they need you doesn't matter when that is if that's two weeks or two years down the line you are there and you are ready and you will welcome them with open arms because you don't equally although I think we want you want to know that somebody is there and your friends are thinking of you there's never a worse time to be suffocated Mm. (laughs) because because life is so suffocating life is so noisy and terrifying the last thing you need is your phone permanently you know we need to come and see you we need to come and see you I need to see you I need I think it comes about their need rather than yours I I definitely had people said "I, I need to I just need to see you and like for some people I wanted to see them and I was like yes I need to see you too um, but some for some people it was like, oh, this just feels a bit a bit odd because I wouldn't have seen you otherwise. So this does feel a bit strange. I think the thing that actually that I would say is whatever you do, whatever you say, say just say out loud what you're kind of thinking, like what your thought process is. It's like I ha- I've got I've got some very lovely thoughtful friends, like particularly psychologists who think an awful lot anyway. Yeah. Um, and uh, actually something that really I found very, very helpful was someone saying, like, I wanted to buy you this. I've decided to buy you this. I don't know if it's the right thing or not. This is what I was thinking. You might not agree, but here it is. And if it, and if you, if it's right or wrong, then you tell me. And, and it was just helpful knowing what her thought process was. Like she didn't know whether it was helpful or not. And she told me, I don't know. I don't know if it is, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I found that, I found that quite liberating that I could just say, yes that's helpful no that's not helpful they gave me the permission to say whether I liked it or not or it was helpful or not I didn't have to kind of get up the courage to say oh when you did that that was really difficult or awkward or I didn't need that or that was unhelpful they were able to say and just yeah they led me into that to say yeah I need oh, some friends in don't psychologists. Do that. <laughs> but I'll lend them to you. <laughs> but I do remember, you know, saying to one of my friends when she first came to see me because she went as if to ask a question about Teddy, about my birth, and then about his when I had him, and and she she then sort of followed up with, "We don't have to talk about this if you don't want to, or, or do you want me to? Like, do you want to be normal about that part of it, or you?" And so, in that moment, I said to her, "Just." Nothing's too stupid. Nothing. No question is too stupid. Nothing's out of bounds. Um, I'm still me. You're still you. If it's really offensive, I'll tell you. And, you know, if it's not, then you've got the answer to your question. But let's just talk about it. And so I kind of just gave her a hall pass. I gave her a free card to just to say what she thought out loud and ask whatever she wanted to ask. And, and actually worked really well. So everybody I saw from that time on, I just said, yeah, go for it. Thank you. Thank you for being so open and honest and, uh, and, and you know, I've not been shy in saying that I thought this was going to be a really difficult one. We have all cried. I have done many head tilts, but it's a natural thing for me, I promise. I would have done it. Whoever was in the room, I would have tilted my head. It becomes a nervous thing. As soon as you say don't do it, you can't stop yourself. I tilt my head and I nod. It's what I do. Um, But please go and check out uh, the ladies' blog. It's Feathering the Empty Nest and Dear Orla. Uh, They're both amazing uh, and really fascinating reads. Um, Whatever side of the fence you sit on, whatever, you know, whatever you've gone through in life, I think they are really insightful and... um, emotional but uh really important to read thank you ladies thank Thank you you for having us us. happy mum happy baby is brought to you in association with fisher price fisher price toys are a great way to mark a child's special milestones as well as support their everyday play giving parents a helping hand so they can focus on the most important job in the world nurturing their child's development